the destitute widow who chooses faithfulness over ease and becomes a hero of the faith and an ancestor to the savior of the world. Ruth encounters God through the person of Boaz. She claimed her purpose by following the instructions of her mother-in-law, Naomi. Maintaining her integrity despite her circumstances, not sitting back, but pursuing her Redeemer, and through her pursuit, engaging her calling. Giving birth to a son, a son who would become the grandfather of a man after God's own heart, a giant slayer, king of Israel, ancestor of Jesus. Before any of this, Ruth and Orpha were only seen as widows, fully dependent on their mother, Naomi. The catalyst that changed Ruth's whole life was her choice to experience community. Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, going all the way through 22. It says, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah, one of the daughters-in-law, kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, like, that was a good speech, right? <laughs> I was like, I don't think this is working. <laughs> she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. There's a lot we got to cover today. But I, I just want to maybe give this word first this morning. To say, if you feel like Naomi, that the Lord has afflicted you, that the Almighty has turned you bitter. 
I just want to call to your attention that this is Ruth chapter 1. And there's more to the story. I want you to know there's more to your story. You're just in a beginning chapter. God's got more he wants to do in your life. I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, in this place, in your presence, do what only you can do. God, we declare today that this is a move, not ours, yours. Let us get swept up in it in a way that we can't possibly even comprehend, that you would do exactly what you have set out to do. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, uh, four people, fist bump, high five, whatever you want. Elbow tap, chest bump, probably not that. Just to be clear, I said chest bump in there. Most of you missed that. I probably shouldn't have said it, but. I'm so excited uh, today, uh, this series. I have, I have always uh, stayed away from, if I could say, like the classic Bible passages. I, I've always stayed away from them. <laughs> Just because I've always thought, like, if I don't feel like I've got something new, something different, something that I've been impacted by to add to the conversation, I don't want to preach someone else's sermon that I just heard before. And so I have been uh, speaking regularly from Scripture for 18 years now. Oh, old. <laughs> and... Uh, and I have never once, this is not today, just to be clear, because some of you are like, oh, I thought that was Ruth. I've never once preached on David and Goliath, like everyone's go-to. <laughs> not once, because I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like I have anything else to add. <laughs> like, he, he kills him. Like, maybe I'd, I'd focus a little more on the, when David beats Goliath, that then he walks up and cuts off his head. That's the best part. That's the part they leave out in children's church. He slung a stone, hit him in the head. The end. <laughs> what about when he takes his sword and cuts off his head and holds it up? <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> and so I've always, I've always just stayed away from those. I've, I've stayed away from, like, this one on Ruth. It, and the reason why I've stayed away is because, like, if I just say, like, if, if you're new to church, we're thrilled that you're here. This is a fantastic time to be a part of our church and see what God is doing but if you've been in church for a while, like the people who know the story of Ruth, like we all really only know two verses, right? <laughs> Where you go, I'll go, your people, my people, your God, my God, that one throws us off a little bit. <laughs> Where you die, I'll die. That's it. Like, can I ask honestly, has, has anyone else memorized other verses from the book of Ruth? <laughs> or like, oh yeah, Ruth chapter, like not many of us, right? We're just really focusing on that first one. But, but I'm excited about this series because this is what I want you to be able to see is that what we're talking about is, is functionally serving as the mission of this church and the pattern in which God moves. The pattern over and over again throughout Scripture, the pattern over and over again throughout our lives in which God moves. And, and I want you to see that trace through the lives of Ruth and Elijah and David and Paul and I want you to see how God always moves, maybe in new ways, but oftentimes through predictable patterns. And today we're going to look at what it looks like to experience community. Well, oftentimes the first thing God does of bringing someone into your life or sending you into someone else's life. But first we need to bring here. So Naomi, whose name means sweet, I love that. Naomi means sweet. And, and Naomi has two sons and a husband, and both her sons are married to Ruth and to Orpah. And then we don't know the events that have happened, but her husband and both her sons have passed away. And so she turns to go back home. And she goes and she like pulls her daughter-in-laws and pulls Ruth and Orpah in. And she's like, listen, I'm going home. You go to your homes. 
Like they had a custom that may have thrown you off in the reading of the passage that like if a son died, the wife who had no rights of her own, this is not a Bible thing, this is a this time in the world thing, a woman had no rights of her own, and so the Bible actually gave protections that another son would be given so that the wife was still protected, was still provided for. Like that's the part that really throws us off. She's like, should I have more sons? And you're like, how old are they? This is weird. It throws me off still, even though I know that. I'm like, oh, that still feels weird. But she like looks at the daughter and she's like, no, go back home. And, and it says, I, I don't think, like, it says, and they say, no, we're going with you. I don't think that's fully how it played out. Like, have you ever like gone to eat with someone and they're like, have one bill or two? And you're like, two. And the other person's like, one. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, one. Sorry. We were both going to offer to pay at the same. Am I the only one who's ever done that? Or the rest of you the most generous people in the world? <laughs> and then they're like, this, and I, I just feel like all along, like Ruth is like, no, we're going with you. And Orpah's like, we're going to, yeah, we're going with you. Sure. <laughs> and she goes, no, 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 go back home. And so Orpah like greets Naomi, kisses her goodbye, walks off back home, and Ruth stays with Naomi. Has anyone ever taken a long trip with their mother-in-law? Yeah, <laughs> that's what Ruth does. Uh, years ago, our family, uh, we went to, I went with my wife's family. They did this trip like up and down California, like hit all these different cities in California. And like three days before we went on this trip, I got mono. I didn't get mono in junior high like everyone else did because they were kissing each other. I got mono as a grown adult from sharing a microphone. <laughs> And so I got money, and I was just like exhausted. And I felt like all we, like every single night we were in a different hotel. And so like we go in, we'd, we'd unpack the car. I felt like all I did was unpack the car, repack the car, and take naps. Like that was my whole experience of California. People were like, this is beautiful. I was like, I don't know, I was exhausted. I slept the end. All I did was pack the car. And, and this one time we're, we're driving down the road, and I could see a couple of them sitting in the passenger seat, half asleep. My wife is driving. And all of a sudden, all our vehicles pull over on the side of the road. And I look up and there's this sign for the city in California named Mono. <laughs> and I'm just looking and I'm like, no. And I can see my mother-in-law stick her head out of the window of the vehicle in front of me and be like, come on. <laughs> and I had this quick thing, I was like, which will take more effort to disagree with my mother-in-law that no, I am not getting out of the car and taking a picture with the sign that says Mono. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> So I walked over to the sign that says Mono and stood like a child. <laughs> Took the picture, went back to the passenger seat, fell asleep. <laughs> Take a trip with your mother-in-law? Ruth's like, I'm going with you. And they, get this, Naomi, not just her mother-in-law, Naomi names herself bitter. <laughs> can, can you get that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, I don't know how you are on a road trip, but imagine if you got in the car with someone like, you're like, hey, how's this going to be? You're like, call me bitter the rest of the trip. That's what I want to be. That's what Naomi does. She goes, my name was sweet. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because that's how I feel. And Ruth stays with her. And because Ruth stays with her and returns to her hometown, she spares Naomi from the bitterness that she had already given herself over to. Na Naomi didn't give Ruth much to work with. Could we acknowledge that? She was like, no, I want to be by myself. Ruth goes, I'm going with you. She goes, no, I'm returning to my hometown. She goes, I'm still with you. She goes, no, no, I'm just going there to die. She goes, where you die, I'll die. I'm going with you. You have to call me bitter. I'll call you bitter. That's fine. We're going back to your hometown. And God works in incredible ways because of the commitment and faithfulness of Ruth. That He didn't just spare Ruth, but he spared Naomi in the process. Like, Naomi never becomes bitter fully because Ruth is still there because she is committed to her in, in not just a good season, in a bad season. He spares her. I bring all that up because you might be Naomi. Oh, well, this is fun. I enjoyed that. Turn to your neighbor. Uh, turn to the other neighbor. Say, you, you got a little Naomi in you. 
Oh, come on. You know it. You know it. Most of you looked at who were sitting with your significant other, you looked at your spouse first, and I was like, oh, let's go the other way on that. <laughs> you do. Can we acknowledge that? You might have a little bit of Naomi in you. It's okay. And you go, no, 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 I'm not bitter. I'm just guarded. I've been there. Okay, that's a weird way of saying bitter. <laughs> or you go, I don't know, Kevin, I'm not bitter. I'm just honest. I just tell it like it is. Well, the stuff that's coming out of you is looking pretty bitter, just so you know. It's okay. I've got, I've got a little Naomi in me. Could I acknowledge that? Is that okay? I got a little Naomi in me. I got a little bitterness. You know, there's, there's two things in the world that make me crazy. I have two pet peeves, okay? Uh, the first one is people who don't understand how to walk in a crowd. My goodness. Like when you're walking in a large crowd, you obey the laws of traffic. Can we acknowledge that? Like no one is driving down the road, stops in the middle of the road, and takes a picture of the sunset. You don't do that. You pull over to the side of the road to take your stupid picture with the sign that says mono. That's how it works. But like, oh my gosh, how many times I've been walking along with a group of people and I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? We walk on the right side of the sidewalk. Did you come straight from Britain? Like, what, what is this? 10 people wide when there's the three? Like, come on, there's two lanes of traffic. Is there anyone else who can like empathize with where I'm at in this moment? And how to walk. So I have two pet peeves. One, people who don't know how to walk in a crowd. Two, people who have a lot of pet peeves. Let me tell you what really bothers me. No, 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 you're already bothering me. <laughs> I have no interest in hearing it. I got a little Naomi in me. Is that okay? I do. We all have a little Naomi in us. We got a little, we got a little bitterness. We got a little frustration. You ever just been like done with people? I am done. I need no more people in my life. That's it. Like what's bothering you? People as a whole. It's really hard to get away from people. They're everywhere, and you are one. <laughs> That's the worst. There was this interesting thing that came out during the pandemic, as everybody was kind of in place in their homes, detached from their communities. For a lot of people, it created this narrative of, I don't need people. I don't need people. More cats, less people. More dogs, less people. I don't need people. I'm good. But, but simultaneously as this narrative was being elevated of I don't need people, mental health issues skyrocketed. Suicide watch skyrocketed. There's this weird thing, I don't need people. But it seems like you do. <laughs> I don't need people. I'm done with people. Yeah, but our, our wellness reports say very, very differently. This is maybe one of the things I really want you to see today. Healthy community is healing. Healthy community is healing. It, in the book of James, it says it like this. It says, confess your sins to one another and be healed. You go, oh, I just confess my sins. No, 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 confess your sins to God and be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and be healed. Healthy community is healing. See, see, what I believe that can happen any single moment, I believe that when you encounter God, the trajectory of your life can be changed in a single moment. Like in a second, when God's spirit is present, it can change what your future reality is going to be. It can change in a second. But I also believe this, the transformation takes place over time in the context of community. It's, it's healing. We just add this here, like toxic community is also toxic. <laughs> but healthy community is healing. Is this study that was done of people who were addicted 
to substances, to all sorts of things, to behaviors, to habits. And, and what they found was this, that the resilience of the individual in terms of avoiding addiction or recovering from that addiction did not have to do with what they were addicted to or their usage of any individual thing. It had to do with their level of healthy connection in their life. It blew me away. And, and they found this, they said that the opposite of addiction is not abstinence, the opposite of addiction is connection. That putting healthy community in your life is the most responsible, proactive thing you can do for your present and your future health. It's healing. Here's what's really difficult about something like this today, is I can't explain to you community. Make sense? I can't be like, well, here's community. And you go, that's great. Now I know community. You, you can only experience community. It's not enough to hear it. It's not enough to know it. You can only experience it. This uh, significant moment in my life in which I had to make a couple key decisions you just get like, man, every, every advice giver in the world comes out of the woodworks. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life. You have a decision like, everybody's got a bit of advice. And sometimes I just want to look at those people and be like, your life is not working out that well. <laughs> Why are you telling me what to do? <laughs> is that too much? <laughs> ah, you've experienced it. You've either experienced it or you are that person, and that's how I let you know. Quit giving other people advice. It's not going so well. <laughs> Everybody in the world was giving me advice and I uh, went to my friend VJ continuously and asked him his advice and he would never give me advice. I was like, oh, VJ, what do you think? What do you think? And finally, at one point in time, he just said, listen, I am praying continuously that God clarifies for you what you are supposed to do. And when he tells you, I'm going to give you a hug and I'm going to say, let's go. That was community. That, 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 was, that was one of the most significant moments in my life in which I experienced that. Where you go, I'll go. Your people, my people. My wife says it like this to me whenever we are fed up with our four children. <laughs> she said, if you leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> There's something about community that takes place that is just different. It's powerful. It, it, it shapes who you are in a way that nothing else can. And this is what is phenomenal about Ruth, is Ruth chooses community before she experiences community. Ruth chooses on the front end. Oh, let's look at, it. Let's look at the famous part. Verse, verse 16 of Ruth chapter 1. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my... Have you ever had the friend that you like met their friends and you didn't like their friends? You get that? Am I the only one who's ever done that? Like, you got a friend and then you meet their other friends and you're like, Who are these people? I don't even know who you are anymore. She goes, your people, whoever they are, they're my people. She says, your God. She already knew who Naomi's God was. She's not leaving it up in the air. She's like, Naomi, whichever God you pick. No, no, no. She knows Naomi. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. She, she has not wandered into this nation that isn't her own. She has not entered into this community yet that she is completely unfamiliar with. And on the front end, before she experiences it, she goes, I am choosing community. I am choosing people. You know how hard that is? Of course you know how hard that is. Because you go, it is on the front end, she says, I am choosing to trust you and be with you no matter what comes with it. I am with you. That's so difficult. Because like, what if they're jerks? What if all Naomi's friends are really awkward and weird? What, what if they don't like Ruth? What, what if they don't wanna be with her? What if they don't think, what if they think Ruth should have gone back to her hometown? She chooses community on the front end. 
See, th this is what I found is that skepticism will always be validated. You walk into a scenario and you're skeptical of the people there, you will find a reason to validate your worst assumptions, to, to assume the worst. You will always find evidence to attach to it to go, I was right. Of course I was right. I knew it would turn out this way. I knew this wouldn't work out. It, can, can I say it like this? Every week I give you ammo should you choose to use it against me. Every week. Like, what do you give somebody, if you leave the church, you go, I left the church. Why? Because our pastor, like one time we were walking in a crowd and I stopped in front of him and <laughs> man, I, I knew he was mad and I was. <laughs> Every week I give you ammo. To be brutally honest, sometimes some people have used it against me. But far more often, my trust has been validated. So sometimes people have said, well, he thought that, and he struggled with it, and he yelled at his kid this way in line and stuff like that, and mm, I don't want to be a part of that. But far more often, I've had people share, I've been there, I know what you're feeling. I felt that and has been able to help both of us see God in a new and a powerful way that we hadn't before, to see God do something different. I, I need you to see this. Your skepticism, if you walk into community, if you walk into church and go, oh, I'm sure it's going to be like this. I know it'll go this way. You will find evidence to validate that. I've seen the outcomes of trust. And even in betrayal, I like those outcomes far better. Choosing not to trust, I don't like any of the outcomes that that comes with my life. I'm guarded, I'm protected, but it's not healthy. This can be hard because for some of you, if your trust has been broken, if you've been hurt, you tell yourself, I'm never going to experience that again, but you miss all the benefits that come with choosing to trust. Ruth chooses community. She chooses on the front end. Could we, could we acknowledge how phenomenal that is? This is why these are like really the only two verses in Ruth that most of us have ever heard of. <laughs> because it's so amazing because we never see this. We never see this level of commitment. We never see this level of covenant through ordinary relationships to go, hey, if your life gets a mess, I'm still with you. If you get all bitter, I'm still with you. But Ruth isn't the only one. I need to show you something that I found. Ready? Uh, I don't know how many of you, sorry, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm gonna go like all Bible geek on you for the next like 60 seconds. Some of you are like, you're a geek? <laughs> you better believe it, especially about the Bible, sorry. <laughs> like this, this blew me away. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the person Rahab. Like Rahab is listed, like Hebrews 11, a hall of faith, significant person. She's in the lineage of Jesus. There's only like three women that are listed in the descendants of Jesus. Ruth is one of them. Rahab is another one of them. She was a prostitute in a distant land who turned to God's people. We're going to look at her account in just a second. So, so Ruth has her mother-in-law, Naomi, okay? Tracking? We already covered this, right? Nod your head. Let me know that you're with Ruth, Orpah, mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth has another mother-in-law because in the rest of the book of Ruth, we're not going to have time to cover this today. She marries a man by the name of Boaz. She goes to his threshing floor, gathers wheat, sleeps at the foot of his bed. He wakes up. She's at his feet. He's like, whoa, there's somebody at my feet. And he goes, redeems her. You should read it. Four chapters. You can read it, right? You can turn to your neighbor. Say, you can read it. Four chapters. I already read one of them for you. You got three to go. You're perfectly fine. Okay. So Ruth, mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth has another no mother-in-law. It's Rahab. Blew my mind. Like I can't even begin to touch it. And I was like walking all up and down our offices. I was like, did you know that Ruth's other mother-in-law was Rahab? And, and I found this. Like the only people who knew this were either people named Ruth <laughs> Or people who had done the Beth Moore Bible study on Ruth, they're all like, oh yeah, duh. I'm like, Sorry, that wasn't offered to me. I had no idea this was taking place. So Ruth gets remarried to Boaz, cool name, and her mother-in-law, the mother of Boaz is Rahab. Let me show you Rahab's story, okay? Can we look at Rahab's story? We still got energy for that? Goodness gracious, you better. Thank you. 
Joshua chapter two. This is like, so let me show you what's taking place, okay? Here you go. So we have like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all books written by no Moses that covers the beginning of it. Then we have Joshua who takes the succession from Moses. We're going to look at him in the last week of this series, the book of Joshua. Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. Very small book. Okay, Ruth, four chapters. Three chapters that you haven't read that you can read on your own. Cool, we got that. Okay, Ruth shows us what takes place right after Joshua, where we see Rahab's story. So this is Joshua chapter 2. It says this, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from... (laughs) Can I tell you something really fun? So one of the things that I'm really excited about is we're connecting what we're doing in here with our children's ministry. (laughs) So every single week, the kids are learning what you're learning in here. So parents, you know how to start a conversation with your kids. We want to make it as easy as possible to start a conversation with your children about faith. Isn't that amazing? Like, oh, I am so pumped about that. And so we've got this key memory verse that we're going to give you at the end of the service today that's going to have a lock screen that's super cool, and it's got a key question that you can talk about as a family. Even if you don't, you can talk about with your friends, your community, whoever that is. And so to our children's pastors, I said, hey, the memory verse for this week is Joshua chapter 2, verse (laughs) 1. It's not. But they were like, what? What? Are you sure? God told me. <laughs> Sent two spies from, from a city. <laughs> Go look over the land, he said. <laughs> Sorry. Especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, I'm just going to read this through. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. And that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. For when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God in heaven above and on the earth below. Oh, let me... mm. The the neighboring, the enemy nation, the people who are not God's people, when they see God work through the faithfulness of his people, it says their courage melted, their hearts dropped. If if you wonder, like too often in our world, we talk about this is how the world gets better. This is how the world gets better. This is what's wrong with the world. These people are what's wrong with the world. They acknowledge in this moment that when they were faithful to what God had put upon them, that everyone else's courage melted because they knew that their God was faithful and would act. Verse 11, when we heard of it, Our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them. That you will save us from death. Our lives, for your lives, the men assured her. 
If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Ruth chooses community before she experiences community. She chooses loyalty to her mother-in-law. Rahab chooses God, becomes a traitor to her own people, but in so doing, chooses community before she ever experiences community. Ruth and Rahab, even though distant by blood relation, have this incredible thing in common. They choose to trust when they were given no reason to trust. And their trust is rewarded and validated because they chose people. Oh, I need you to see this. I think what has happened is we have taught master's level education on relationship. And we've taught things like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Your, your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. We've taught things like you're the sum total, the average of the five people that you're closest with. Have you heard this? You're the, you're the average income, the average health, the average quality of life of the five people that you're closest with. Some of you are realizing this for the first time right now. You're like, oh, shoot, I need some new friends. Oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is not going well. That's not the point of the message today. We've, we've taught master's level education on relationships, and we miss this more important point. God picks people. I, I don't mean he picks people. He picks people. He chose people. Like when God created, it wasn't because he was lonely. <laughs> like he wasn't up in heaven and like, what am I going to do today? And the Holy Spirit's like, what's a day? <laughs> like, I don't know. Let's make one. Let's make a whole universe while we're at it. I don't believe God talks like that either, just to be clear. Like God wasn't lonely. It was out of the overflow of his community that he created. When, when it says that the Lord walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day, it wasn't because he was bored of heaven. They're like, man, those streets of gold. How lame does that get? Let's go to the garden. Why did I make mosquitoes? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, like he, he wanted to be, I turned my mic off. That was on me. <laughs> like, that was it. He wanted to be close to people. He chose people. Like, this is like when, when Jesus came to earth, it says that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Like, this is his point. God chose you. He chose it, not, not future you, not better you, not non-bitter you. He chose you, who you are. He picked you. Like, church, how amazing is that? God picked people over and over again. And then let me show you this. This is, uh, this is Matthew chapter 2. If we can put it, I don't know where it is. Is it there? Is it here? Put it somewhere that I can find it in a hurry. Matthew chapter 2. This is Jesus and the disciples, the apostles. It's coming. Maybe it's not Matthew chapter 2. Maybe it's Matthew chapter something else. Give me whatever the, there we go. Oh, there we go. I knew it was there. So it says this. It says, these are, no, not that one, the other one. Ten. I was close. First two. I had the right book. You guys didn't even know that Rahab was Ruth's mother-in-law. Get out of here. So it says this. It says, these are, these are the disciples that Jesus has picked. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Keep going. Verse 3. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Let's remember that. Matthew, the tax collector. It says James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Keep going, verse 4. Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Matthew, the tax collector. Simon the zealot. The zealots were a group of people that wanted to violently overthrow the government. Matthew, the IRS agent who worked for the government. Could you imagine that? Jesus goes. Like, could you imagine when, when Jesus brought in Simon? I, I think Matthew was already there, and they're hanging out. Matthew's there, probably counting stuff. So, hmm, audit that, audit that. Here we go. Do you have expense reports for those things? Here we go. And Simon, who wants to violently overthrow the government, walks in, and Matthew's like, he's with us? For serious, Jesus? 
Like he's with us? Yep. Let's go. We're going to travel the world together for three years. You're going to do everything together. The person who works for the government and the person who wanted to violently overthrow the government because they were united in something that was bigger, a mission that was more important, something that mattered. See, I, I need you to see this. This is so important. Like, so, so often we think the purpose of talking about church is to talk about sin. God is not nearly as anti-sin as he is pro-humanity. His love for you is so great that it causes him to hate what will destroy you. The things that I hate, I, I hate it when cars drive through my neighborhood way faster than they should. Not because I'm a cranky old man. It might be. Because I love my kids, and I don't want them to be at risk. God hates sin because he loves you. His love for you exceeds far vastly superior to anything that his dis he dislikes. And if, if you heard in a moment, God hates this, God hates that, you missed the greater point. He is for you. He loves you more than anything else. And so, in a world full of Naomi's, we must be a church of Ruth's. In a world full of people who are bitter, we must decide to be a people who are committed to community. We recently had two people who were newer to Highland Park come in and we interviewed them in front of our whole staff. Don't worry, if you go to the Blue Balloons today, we're not going to do that to you. We've already done it once. <laughs> and we just asked them, because for so many of us, we've worked in church for a while, we forget what it's like to walk in new. And we said, what's it like? And they didn't comment on how amazing the sermon was. or the music, or any of these other things. You know what they said? Someone sat with me. That's what they said. Someone sat with me. Blew me away. And, and you may look at that and you go, well, well, Kevin, that didn't happen to me. No one did that for me. Why should I, like, could, could we just say, like, this isn't that hard? Like, isn't that the world that we want? Like, I, man, this is a couple years ago. I was kind of counseling this group of guys who were college age and they were all single. And they're like, Kevin, what should we do? We're all single, we don't wanna be single. Quit hanging out with dudes all the time. <laughs> could, could we just acknowledge some problems aren't that complicated? <laughs> hanging out with dudes. <laughs> Man, after that chapter two, verse one, and everything else is gone. <laughs> The problems aren't complicated because they require courage. The problems aren't complicated because the reason why people act isn't because they don't understand. It's because it requires a level of courage that we're not used to. You go, that didn't happen to me. Isn't it what you want to happen to you? Isn't it the world that you want to be a part of? Say, I, I want you to know if you came here by yourself and no one sat with you, you can sit with me next week. If there's too many of us, Half of you can sit with my wife, the rest of you can sit with me. If you're a dude, you can sit with me by myself behind my wife. <laughs> Today we looked at the lives of four women. Four women. We looked at Ruth, who chose community through loyalty. We looked at Rahab, who chose God by choosing community. We looked at Naomi. This is what is said at the very end after Ruth marries Boaz, Rahab's son, and they give birth to a son. Ruth chapter four, verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said, to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. 
May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Can I give you the part of that that blew me away? She's still Naomi. She's not Mara. She wants to give herself over to bitterness, but Ruth didn't let her. She's still sweet when she wanted to be bitter. Four women. Four? Ruth? Rahab? Naomi? Orpah. Orpah. Orpah's forgotten because she chose what was easy. I'm not saying Orpah's wrong. She had every right to do what she did. But she chose easy. And so she is forgotten. Be like Ruth. Be like Jesus. Less finger pointing. More embracing. Less complaining. More welcoming. Not, not, not that, well, they didn't do it for me, and so I won't for them, and because they didn't, I won't. And it's going to be like, no, 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 no. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God, where you go, I go all the days of our life. Amen. Church, will you stand to your feet in this moment? This is what I want you to hear more than anything else. That before you did anything, God made a move towards you. This is not our move. This is his move because he moved towards you. Come on, church, let's celebrate that today. It's his move. It's his move. It's his move.